Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm uh, really pleased to be here today to talk about Muslim women and the challenges that we face. But I'm also a little bit nervous as well because it's different when you sit in a setting where you know every, you know you know people and it's your family and things in front of you as well. So um, you know, but I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so today I um, thought I would sort of look at this subject um, from a sort of broader perspective because in the media and in the news and actually in probably quite a few sections of society even within our own Muslim communities, I think Muslim women are the most talked about subject um, in one shape or the other. So I thought before I sort of dive in and talk about all the sort of challenges and the negative things that Muslim women have to deal with, um, and not all of us, I might add, but unfortunately, there are these various challenges that Muslim women have to deal with. I will talk about some of the challenges that women have to deal with more broadly, um, and women in the UK, um, and just to kind of situate and contextualize where we are um, as Muslim women, as British Muslim women. Um, so hopefully I will talk about the broader context, then I will talk about um, intersectionality, what that means, um, and I will talk about some of the external challenges that we face as Muslim women. And when I mean by external challenges, I mean challenges that are outside of the Muslim community, uh, external factors that sort of affect us. Um, and then I will discuss um, the internal challenges. What are the challenges that come from within our communities that are so sort of specific and particular to us being born and raised Muslim in the Western country? Um, and then I will briefly look at potentially what we can do to overcome some of these internal challenges. So before I begin, I want to ask, um, I want to ask all of you, you know, what are your thoughts? Do you think we live in an equal society? If I, maybe I could just have like a show of hands of people who think we live in an equal society. Well, that, that's a good question. So, what, I mean, what, what, do you, what do you perceive equality to be? Um, why don't you tell me? Actually, that would be a good idea. We have rich and poor. We have, uh, you know, female and female. Then we have different cultures. We have different educational background. So everybody's different. So yeah. not necessarily equal, but each one is different. I don't know whether, because it can, can be quite wide, can't it, really? Yeah. It can, it can, and that's interesting. So we're different, but not necessarily equal. And then there's health as well, whether the person you know, mentally well or not, and then whether they're child or adult. So this whole aspect of it, this is very wide ranging. It is, it is wide, and I left it sort of wide purposefully. Um, does, does anybody else have any other thoughts about what it means to be equal or live in an equal? Let me ask you, what does it mean to live in an equal society? Let's put it that way. control don't determine who you are, what you can do. Um, so kind of things that you cannot control don't then limit you. Um, that's what I'd see as equality. So being female or being black or, you know, having a particular religion, those things are, well, I guess religion might be in t within your control, but um, those things aren't determining factors in terms of your life chances or, or, or kind of achieving your potential. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good answer, actually. Um, and if if as Muslims, I guess one thing that we can all relate to is this sort of is this idea that we are discriminated against in different ways because of simply because of our faith. Um, sometimes that manifests more for some people and than others. And I'll talk a bit more about how that actually affects Muslim women quite a lot a bit later on. Um, so looking at the broader context, then um, I am talking about. I'm going to focus specifically on gender equality, so equality between men and women in this country. And if we take a more broader look, so looking, not thinking about Muslim women specifically, but thinking about um, your average woman in the UK, um, it's widely accepted that all women face some sort of inequality across all areas of their lives. Um, so, for example, we still have some way to go before achieving equal representation in the House of Commons. Um, and indeed, women are a minority in boardrooms. Um, I think there's about 
well, it says there, there's about 25% of judges are women, which is actually quite, it's, it's actually an improvement over the last few years. Um, but that affects the criminal justice system. And um, it's pretty safe to say that in the majority of editorial suites of most major media outlets, women are a minority. You, it will be a, a rare find to find a woman as a sort of top editor in a media outlet. And that, of course, affects decisions that are made about stories that um, are put together for the media, whether it's in the papers or broadcast media, um, and it affects the sort of framing around women and how women are talked about. Um, so you can see in the quite key spheres of life, you know, law, um, where decisions are made around the criminal justice system and how justice is executed, um, decisions made in the public sphere you know, within the House of Commons, um, and also uh, the sphere of um, the media, women are a minority. And that means that their experiences and their voices are not being meaningfully represented in those areas, in those spheres of life. Um, if we look at education, girls actually do quite well in school and up until about um, in school and also at university until about degree level um, they enjoy higher educational achievements however the outcomes are not equitable if you actually look at the types of subjects that girls are taking um, and that boys are taking especially in sort of secondary school level and then um, post-secondary school level you will find that boys are sort of um, taking subjects which will lead them to higher paid careers, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, and, and, and I mentioned technology-related fields as well. And girls are sort of not taking those subjects. Um, and then actually, as a woman, you, what you will find is that you probably outperform um, your, you know, you outperform boys and men at primary school, secondary school, university, um, and then when you uh, leave university and you go into your sort of first job or whatever, you'll be at similar level as, as your male colleagues. And then when it starts coming to sort of promotions at sort of mid-management level, you'll find that you start to, um, your male colleagues will overtake you basically and they will start to be paid more and they will be promoted faster and they will be promoted further. So there's an inequality there and within education, although it's not obvious, and then that also leads to inequality in employment. Um, and that means that actually women occupy the lowest paid jobs um, in the country. And um, we call these jobs the five C's. And I've got a slide which will show you that um, next. But it's the five C's stand for cleaning, catering, clerical, cashiering, retail, and caring work. So those are the five Cs, the five roles that women tend to occupy. Um, and I mentioned that men are more commonly to be in higher, higher paying jobs. Um, and then we have what's known as the pay gender gap, where uh, from sort of when a woman reaches her mid-20s, she'll start finding that men are basically being paid more. Um, and I think Broadly, if you just compare men and women, um, there's about 11% difference in the salary between men and women. Um, and then when you start drilling down into specific careers and specific roles, then that will, will, will broaden more and more. Um, and then in terms of other inequalities that women face, well, women um, in, on an everyday basis will experience routine um, sexual harassment, um, they will routine, that will face routine sort of violence within the home uh, in terms of domestic violence. And actually, violence against women and girls remains one of the most serious and widespread inequalities within the UK. Um, and with the sort of onset of new technology and social media, actually we're seeing some forms of violence against women and girls increasing. Um, so there is this um, startling statistic, which some of you may know, that in the UK, two women a week are killed by a man that they know. So somebody in their home or in their family or a partner, somebody that they know basically. Um, and there's some researchers who've actually been so concerned by this that they've coined a term called femicide. 
because this um, this pattern of violence is gendered. It only happens in terms of men against women. It's not the other way around. There isn't a sort of parity. Sometimes you will, you will hear people talk about um, how there's parity in domestic violence, but actually, the, when you really drill down, there isn't. Of course, men can also um, be subjected to domestic violence and sexual harassment or sexual violence as well. But overwhelmingly, men are the perpetrators and women are the victims. So how does something like violence against women and girls relate to the sort of broader issues I spoke about um, in terms of the lack of representation of women in the House of Commons or um, you know, uh, the criminal justice system? How, how do those two relate? Well, it's, it's actually quite sort of, um, when, you, when you look at it, it's actually quite sort of straightforward if you think about it. Um, so, I'll move on a little, I'll talk about, I'll come back to that point actually in a moment. Um, but one thing I want to say on violence against women and girls is that uh, rates of reporting remain very, very low, which means that women are not reporting violence that they're suffering. Um, and then what they find, what women report is that when they do um, report violence um, to the police, um, it's not dealt with in the right way. It's often, they often don't meet, they're not, often not believed or they're not supported. Um, or, and when they try and access justice, they're often sort of turned away. And I can give you an example, actually, of a woman who, um, a Muslim woman who is a qualified lawyer. She's actually a uh, lecturer of law at a university. And um, she was married, she had a certain number of children, and her husband was a sort of community leader. And he basically was violent towards her. She was suffering domestic <coughs> violence. Um, and so she separated from him, and she was going through sort of divorce proceedings. And um, he had basically uh, said that she has to leave the marital home. He was like, right, you know, you get out, take the children, go. Um, so she left, she took her children, um, and this was very, very sort of, um, it, it, was, it, it was, you know, really stressful, really sort of traumatic for her. She just took what she could and she just went. Um, and then at one point she wanted to go back and get things for her children and things for herself. Um, and so when she tried to go back, her husband barricaded the doors, wouldn't let her in. Um, and so she called the police because she wanted to get into the house. She just wanted to get a few things for her and her children. The police turned up and then they you know, went to the house. They spoke to her husband who was in the house. He was the first person that they spoke to. Um, and then after speaking to her husband, they came back to her and they said, um, there's nothing we can do. You know, he's, he's in his right. He's, he's at home. He's locked the doors. He doesn't want you to go in there. This is a civil matter and this is between you and him. And this was just one example of how the criminal justice system is skewed or biased um, against women. Um, and her husband was quite sort of, you know, he was quite aggressive or whatever, but once the police came there, then he sort of changed his sort of manner um, and then sort of uh, basically got them on his side and the police took his side and then they went away. And this woman was left with not being able to get her things for her children. Um, and then she had to go away. And I remember her saying that, you know, I'm a lawyer. She was, you know, she told me I'm a lawyer and I couldn't get the justice system to work in the right way. Imagine what it's like for women who are not lawyers, who are not educated, who perhaps don't even speak the language or they've just arrived in this country. You know, how difficult must it be for them? So that's just one example of how basically how basically um, women are not only sort of suffering violence in terms of their own sort of personal day-to-day -day lives, but actually there is a sort of systemic bias against them. And there's sort of almost like a sort of systemic violence against women in that sense, because, you know, for that woman, she had to then go through an additional trauma um, after having separated from her husband. So I mentioned the five C, so there they are. Um, and actually, I've also put up a key statistic there about the uh, gender pay gap. So the Fawcett Society did some research looking at how the gender pay gap uh, manifests itself. So in recent years, the gender 
pay gap has been closing overall. When you look at the sort of the gap between men and women, I mentioned it's about 11%. It used to be about 20% a few years ago. So it's been closing, which is brilliant. That's fantastic. Um, but then when you look at it, if you disaggregate the data in terms of ethnicity, what you find is that Pakistani and Bangladeshi women, the pay gap is much higher. It's 26.2%. Um, and I think for Somali women, it's even higher than that. Um, so you see that actually, uh, I, I think it's safe to assume that most Pakistani and Bengali women are Muslim. Um, so you can see that being a Muslim adds a sort of an additional barrier um, in terms of gender pay gap. And I'll talk more about the sort of specific um, this was how the specific nature of Muslim women and employment a bit later on. Um, but I thought that was quite interesting. So I'm still talking sort of quite broadly about um, gender uh, inequalities. And um, I wanted to sort of share with you some of the findings by an LSE Commission on Gender Equality. Um, so the LSE Commission on Gender Equality examined four areas, four key areas that affect our life. And I mentioned these already. Um, the economy, politics, law, and media. And they sought to understand how inequality between men and women manifested. Um, and, one of, and, and, and in their investigation, one of the key things they found was that the impact of the economic crisis of 2008 was considerable. And that the austerity measures put in place following the economic crisis disproportionately affected women who actually bore the brunt of those measures, and in particular, minority women. So, you know... It's been a while since 2008, and so now, you know, politicians will talk about, you know, the economy's recovered, business people talk about the economy's recovered, it's doing much better, we're sort of thriving, growing again. Um, but actually, that recovery process has been uneven. And in this sort of post-austerity environment, if that's what I can call it, the law's ability to address urgent issues, such as gender-based violence, which I mentioned a moment ago, and access to the justice system has been adversely affected. So what has happened when um, the government put into place austerity measures, one of the things they decided to do was to cut back on funding to women's refugees. Um, so this is for women, refugees for women who are escaping domestic violence and also um, services for newly arrived and migrant women. Um, so government slashed funding to those services. Um, and what you find and what the um, LSE Commission on Gender Equality reports is that a legislator dominated by men failed to adequately recognise the importance of gender-specific issues whilst devising policy. So what you had is there was, you know, we're in times of austerity, we've got to make cuts, cuts were made, but women bore the brunt of those cuts. So actually, we're now in a possibly more thriving economy than we were in 2008, well, it's thank you to the women, you know, for, apart from just, do, you know, fulfilling those five C roles, they've also had to sacrifice things that have impacted directly on their everyday life as well, and their access to the criminal justice system. So the LSE Gender Commission investigated the links between gender inequality and the operation of gender based power across the four most important sectors of society, the economy, political system, legal system, and the world of media, culture, and communications. And by doing this, they produced an integrated analysis which effectively demonstrated how persisting gender inequalities and power imbalances between men and women within those four sectors of society invariably affect, affect the access to opportunities, status, position or the worth of rights available to women. So what it's saying, essentially, is that those key areas, those big, those, those sort of big picture areas, you know, houses of commons, uh, media, you know, law, business, where you don't see women in the sort of the, the top jobs and the sort of, you know, represented meaningfully at every level, actually has a very big impact on the everyday lives of individual women. Um, and I think sometimes it's difficult to kind of make those connections because often people will sort of say, but, you know, women have a role or women choose not to be in those jobs or they can't, it's impractical. But 
it's detriment to society if women are not represented in those roles. So I've given you a brief rundown of how gender imbalance within those key sectors, um, basically what I've just said is that it affects society as a whole adversely and it has negative consequences on the individual um, and on the individual woman's life in terms of um, the power she has, the rights she has and the recourse she has when she is dealing with difficult issues like domestic violence. So essentially that is... Um, intersectionality, how different um, structures interconnect and interplay with sort of different oppressions to affect an individual's life. So I've put up a uh, definition there, but intersectiona intersectionality essentially recognizes that there are overlapping and interconnected areas of social causes that affect gender inequality. Put simply, intersectionality is the idea that different types of discrimination interacts so that a woman will often experience multiple oppressions. So coming back to Muslim women, um, we know that if you're a Muslim woman, um, you're going to be discriminated against on the base of the fact that um, you know, you're, you're a Muslim woman on the basis of your faith. And what I've just shown you is that you're also going to be discriminated on the face, basis of your gender. Um, and now imagine that you're a Muslim woman um, and you're a woman of colour, then you will be discriminated against, again, more than, say, a Muslim woman who is white. And then imagine you're a Muslim woman who is older. You will be dis discriminated against, again, on the basis of your age. And then imagine you're a Muslim woman who perhaps is older and disabled. And again, you will be discriminated against because of um, a disability that you have. And so these are the sort of the layers of intersectionality. These are sort of the, the, the different sort of systems of oppression that can basically um, uh, produce multiple discriminations for Muslim women. So um, I've kind of sort of listed quite a few, but I, I'd like again to open it up to you and ask you what are the sort of, what do you think are the sort of challenges faced by Muslim women? Maybe we, we'll look at um, the men <laughs> and ask them first. <laughs> the what, sorry? The way they dress. The way they dress, yeah, absolutely. If you're, um, if you're wearing a hijab or niqab, then you're more than likely to be targeted in terms of hate crime. Let me ask the women now. Speak for yourselves. <laughs> um, I guess maybe not necessarily having a voice within cultural institutions or religious institutions. Um, so from um, some forms of segregation can, not the segregation in and of itself, but actually that can lead to l um, a lack of access um, to decision making or people who have decision making power um, in terms of like structures not necessarily being represented in those structures yeah absolutely um, um yeah no go and carry on <laughs> I've, got, I've got quite a long list so <laughs> someone else might want to chip in um carrying on from the lack of voice maybe the media mm -hmm. doesn't help yeah media says about Muslim women and how that defines what people who don't know that much about Islam think about women and about Muslim women in particular yeah and how that shapes their views so if you talk about their dress for example being oppressive that's primarily shaped by what the media has said and how people choose to believe that maybe education could be yeah I think that's a lack of lack of okay yeah sure I, I just assume that you meant lack of yeah. education <laughs> so I guess the question is um, is it that it's Muslim women specifically or is it just a combination of the fact that they're women so they have that discrimination and they're Muslim so they have that discrimination as well or is it further than that? Are, you, are you asking me 
Okay. Anybody want to answer? Or? I think there is a particular... W Sorry. I'm quite happy to be subjugated and they're happy not to go out of the house because it's okay to stay in. So there is that also. Although there are, peop there are women that want to lead a life on an equal footing, there are equally as many women who are quite happy with this seg gender segregation, who are quite happy staying at home and doing things. So that, that is a challenge as well, is to getting the other women to be more willing to kind of understand their role. So they themselves are quite yeah, happy to remain in that subjugated role. That's an interesting perspective. That's, there are some women who perhaps have um, you said subjugated, so internalized maybe some form of gender inequality. And then you also talk about how some women don't want to basically have gender equality. Yeah, they're quite happy. I mean, there yeah. are many women who will say, oh, we shouldn't be doing this because that's the way it is. And I'm saying, well, who says? Yeah. And they say, but that's the way it is and that's the way it should be. And it's yeah. very difficult for them. And especially, I think, the older generation, perhaps, and even some of the younger ones, but yeah, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to think of an example, but I can't think of at the moment one. But I know many are women who, who say, well, you're too feminist. And I'm saying, well, who says? Yeah. Things like that. So, but I, I mean, I know there are women that say, I don't want to go out to work. I want to stay at home. And it's mm. his job to look after me. And that's the way it is. So they're and quite that, happy with that. And that's a challenge, you think? It's a very big challenge because yeah. if you're struggling to ask for, uh, it, and it's, it's their choice if that's what they want to do, but they think it's their choice based on what they've been brought up to believe. Mm -hmm. So it's the cultural upbringing that says a woman's place is in the home to cook and clean and look after the family. And that's fine as long as the woman's made that choice and not been indoctrinated with that belief. And that is a problem, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting, thank you. Well, that's the same comment I was going to make, that if a woman wants to stay at home and doesn't want to go out to work, then that's her choice and her right to do that as well. So we can't force somebody to go out to work just because, you know, that we think is the way to do these days. But if they want to stay at home, then, then why not? Yeah. It's a choice. Sure. Choice is important. No, no. Women don't have to cook and clean. No, no, no. I didn't say that. I said if they want to stay at home and don't go out to work, then that's their choice. Well, in that I case, if you look at like this, <laughs> they, they want to stay at home. They don't want to work. They don't want to go out to work. They don't yeah. want to bring uh, you know, money in. And the men, on the other hand, actually go out and work and whatever. So that pay gap, maybe it's okay, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Well, I mean, you expect that to be, don't that's you? That's interesting. And the same thing you yeah. mentioned about the judges and God knows what. Yeah. But most of the prisoners happen to be men. I, I don't know why. Maybe it's okay if you have the judges to be men. I mean, what's wrong with that? I yeah. don't know why that bothers you. It doesn't bother me. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well Oh, well, you'd be surprised when yeah. it was legislation that changed that because otherwise in factories women got paid less for doing exactly the same job. Yeah, so it, yeah, I mean Birmingham okay. City Council had to pay out millions in compensation because they were paying female carers less than their male carers. Okay, I think... So that's um, the issue. Um, I was going to say that I think this idea of... I was just going to say that I think this idea of choices is, is a is more a crucial point than whether wh which choice people actually make. And I think one of the big problems that Muslim women face is that they don't have the choice to do something that's different to the cultural norm. Um, yeah. And so if they choose to, so if they choose to kind of subscribe to the cultural norm and have particular conceptions of gender roles, then they're more likely to to live kind of particular type or kind of 
kind of fit within that that kind of system, but to choose something different and opposite to the way that the culture has the culture has defined gender roles is is the problem. And so it's not really what they choose; it's the fact that they can't choose otherwise. Yeah, no, I, I think, think that's and that's that's and and sometimes working and not working becomes a red herring um, <coughs> because it's it's kind of detra distracting from the right to choose otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you there. And coming back to the point about uh, sort of gender pay gap. So the overall gender pay gap is 11%, which means that even in the sort of similar roles, there's going to be a sort of 11% difference. And coming back to the sort of cooking and cleaning, and when women do actually, women form a larger part of the workforce. I don't have the statistic with me. Um, but they're doing the lowest paid roles and they're doing it in those five C roles, those cooking and cleaning or whatever. And then actually then when they go home, they're still doing the cooking and the cleaning and the whatever, basically, as well. So, and also I just wanted to mention about the media as well. Yes, we might see a lot of women on TV, but those are not the women who are in the decision-making positions. They're not the ones who are sitting in the morning saying, I'm going to do a story about how hijab is oppressive, how we should have a ban on niqab. They're not the ones that are making those decisions. Men are in those positions predominantly, and men are the ones that are making those decisions. And in those decisions are setting the agenda for the day. Women are then reporting those news, but actually there isn't that many women who are reporting the news, but it feels like it because we see it on TV. Um, and then it's, in fa it's impacting on women's everyday lives, especially Muslim women's everyday lives, which I will come to now. So we're talking about Muslim women, and I mentioned earlier, Muslim women are the most talked about group of women. There isn't a moment when we don't hear about the hijab or the niqab being discussed. And often in the media, Muslim women are either potential jihadi brides who want to blow us all up, or they're framed as poor, oppressed women without agency, and internalized misogyny. And that's why I found um, the point earlier about sort of being willing, willfully subjugated interesting. One of the key criticisms of mo the modern sort of feminist movement, which you would think would be sympathetic to women who are, who are experiencing inequality across the board, is that they do not advocate on behalf of Muslim women. You will not find a feminist who would defend a Muslim woman who wears hijab, even though it's spoken about so much even though Muslim women who wear hijab are more than likely to be attacked on the street. Um, so this is another example of how intersectionality oppresses women, even when you think actually it should be you know, obvious, that it should be an obvious um, subject for feminists, you know, as a sort of people who advocate equality be between men and women, that they would advocate on behalf of Muslim women, but they shy away from it because they don't know how to deal with the issue around hijab. So um, we had just spoken about the uh, sort of challenges that Muslim women face. And um, I just um, wanted to say that I spoke about all the challenges that women face, um, and I spoke about various different issues. But um, I wanted to highlight that there have been some improvements uh, recently. So. I mentioned the austerity measures uh, that cut back funding to women's organizations. Some of that funding has been given back, not all of it, um, or reinstated. And um, obviously there are women in the media as well, and the media is making some progress, not a lot, but in terms of trying to get more women into the media as well. So I just kind of wanted to highlight some positives and not just sound all doom and gloom. So going back to Muslim women, what are the external challenges? Um, there's so many, um, and actually they mirror the broader external, the broader challenges that all women face, basically. Um, but I've just highlighted a few. So anti-Muslim hatred, Islamophobia, in terms of hate crime on the street, that's a very big issue for Muslim women. There are structural discrimination, issues around structural discrimination, around employment and education, um, a lack of access to good health services, depending where you are in the country. It's a complex issue, but that is an issue that affects Muslim women. Lack of access to good housing. Um, I know that's not necessarily something that would affect this community, but it does affect many Muslim women across the country. Um, and then just generally, Muslim women, um, and sort of when you look at all the sort of outcomes that would indicate a sort of good lifestyle, like education, employment, health, housing, that sort of thing, actually, um, 
Muslim women have poorer outcomes compared to other women and other ethnic minorities. Um, and when you look at sort of issues around domestic violence um, and other issues like that, then in certain cases, Muslim women are overrepresented as well, which actually kind of goes against the media narrative. If you sort of uh, were following any of the kind of media stories around sort of sexual grooming cases that happened in different parts of the country, Oxford and Rotherham, you would have the impression that actually it's only Muslim men who are perpetrators in these types of crimes and it's only white women and girls who are victims in these types of crimes when actually you know you, Muslim women um, and girls are also victims and Muslim men are not the only perpetrators of these crimes. And that's why I actually wanted to spend a lot of time talking about the broad issue so that you can understand how Muslims are situated within the wider context. Um, so Let's have a look at um, anti-Muslim hatred. So, Tell Mama, which is a monitoring organisation that monitors Islamophobia on the, on the um, in, in different in different situations, but particularly on the street, they report that Muslim women are more likely to be targeted than Muslim men in terms of Islamophobia. The murder of Lee Rigby and the Charlie Hebdo attacks in 2015 both led to an increase in reported cases of violence against Muslims. Further, the National Police Chiefs Council also reported a 41% jump in racist or religious abuse incidents in the month following the EU referendum. Um, so we're seeing this trend towards uh, hate crime and increasing hate crime. And obviously, with the Brexit vote, it was not just Muslims who were targeted, it was anybody who was perceived to be different, and in particular, Polish migrants. Hate crime data and research by Talmama and a think tank called Demos show that Muslim women are overrepresented in hate crime attacks on the street and online as well. So it's not only that Muslim women are being targeted on the street, it's also online. Um, and, it, and, it, and the data shows that women who are... Um, who wear the hijab or who wear niqab are particularly uh, targeted over and above women who don't wear um, who don't wear either of those or women who wear you know the jilbab and things and um, the University of Cambridge they did some research and they found that non-white Muslim women appear far, far more likely to suffer discrimination on the street but also everyday sort of microaggressions so this is going into the shop and not being served, being ignored maybe, or going on the tube and somebody muttering under their breath about these whatever Muslims. These kind of microaggressions which people, you know, and I've suffered them when I go on the tube or whatever, or when I go into shops. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to bother reporting them. As much as I advocate reporting, you should always report whenever you suffer any crime. But when you have those type of microaggressions and you're on the tube and you just want to get home, you know, you you don't report it. And sometimes I'm so used to it that actually I don't even notice it. And that's actually worrying that we're so used to this type of targeting that we don't even, it doesn't even kind of affect us, but actually it does, but um, consciously it doesn't. So there's lots of data, lots of research which shows that, you know, basically Muslim women are targeted in terms of hate crime and it's increasing, but there is a huge underreporting, so you should absolutely report it. Um, but I understand why some people don't. But organizations like Tell Mama are good because then you can report these sort of microaggressions and then the data, they're recording the data, but it doesn't necessarily have to be raised to the police. So looking at um, structural discrimination. So um, the Women's Equality Committee that sits in Parliament they did some research, they did an extensive report looking at employment and Muslims and in, in that report they looked at uh, the experience of women um, in terms of employment, Muslim women, in terms of employment and education um, and just sort of the experiences in life in general and they concluded that Muslim women face a triple penalty and this penalty is something I mentioned earlier, they face discrimination or barriers on the basis of, of their race, of their gender and of their faith. Um, so how extensive is this sort of structural discrimination? 
Well, if you look at employment, and actually before I sort of begin on that, um, I want to say that actually there isn't that much research. There's only sort of research being done recently. So there's huge gaps in data. And most of the data sort of looks at um, Pakistani and Bangladeshi women and their experiences. But whereas a few years ago, Pakistani and Bangladeshi um, communities made up perhaps 75% of the British Muslim population. Now they make up perhaps about 53%. And as we all know, that you know, Pakistani and Bangladeshi does not necessarily equate to, you know, that's all the sort of Muslim population is. So anyway, looking at um, employment, there is discrimination in recruitment. So if you're um, a Muslim and you send a CV, uh, you're probably going to get face discrimination on the basis of your name. Um, and uh, um, there was a, a research done by, the, by Durham University and they analyzed more than 151,000 applications to Russell Group institutions between 2010 and 2013. And they found that while 54.7% of applications submitted by white students resulted in offers, the, su the success rates were only 30.3% for students of Pakistani background and 31.2% for those students of Bangladeshi background. Um, so you can see that there's a huge disparity if you're from an ethnic minority. And the reason that I only mentioned Pakistani and Bangladeshi backgrounds was because there's no other data. There's no data that tracks you know, um, people by their faith or um, and indeed when you look at sort of Indian backgrounds and you know, that, that's quite mixed so there isn't any data on that and other sort of Muslim backgrounds. Um, so there's, uh, there's that sort of penalty when you just send in your CV. And then um, the report also found that Muslim women who were lucky enough to get an interview, because many don't, when they would be interviewed, they would be asked questions which are essentially legal. Are you married? Do you have children? Do you have to cook and clean? What are your family responsibilities? Are your parents going to let you work? That kind of stereotypical stuff. Um, and uh, when I was reading that, I couldn't believe it, to be honest with you. you know, in, in this day and age, I mean, what, we've got legislation to stop this kind of thing from happening. But it's happening, and apparently it's on the increase as well. Um, and then looking at um, women who perhaps try and get support in terms of um, getting employment, when they, Muslim women in particular, when they go to the job centre, they report that they don't get much support, um, they're not really offered that many sort of opportunities. Um, and again, just I guess they're sort of diverted to the sort of five C's that I spoke about earlier as well. Um, so there is this sort of structural discrimination around employment. Um, and so Muslim women have higher levels of unemployment and higher levels of economic inactivity compared to their counterparts counterparts. And I know earlier we said that there are some women who choose, they choose not to work. And that's fine if it's a choice. But I think in a sort of community like this, people can afford to make that choice. But there are communities, Muslim communities around the country who live in very deprived areas where they cannot afford to make that choice. You need the husband and the wife to work. And we know that things are getting more difficult. You can't sort of just rely on the state to sort of supplement your income anymore. Um, and people can't make that choice. And then when they try and go out and get work, they're facing all these barriers, basically. And then there's also the barriers, the traditional barriers around childcare and what have you. Um, and I mentioned the pay gap before, that it's uh, around 26% if you're um, Pakistani or Bengali, and we sort of say, we make that synonymous with Muslim, basically. We assume that that's kind of the average for a Muslim woman. Um, <clears throat> and I mentioned poverty. So around, um, I think, 10% of the British Muslim population live um, in the most deprived, in the most poor areas of the country. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I think it's about 10%. And this has an impact on um, the access to education. That uh, and the education that's available to uh, Muslims in general, but particularly for Muslim girls as well. Um, and the result is is that Muslim girls, um, not all, but some, are not achieving the right levels of educational attainment at school that is needed to attend a Russell Group University. 
So internal challenges. So we spoke about this earlier. Um, and there was quite a few that came out. And I think we probably know all of them. Um, so I've just listed here some of the things that were actually mentioned in the report by the Women's and Equalities Committee in Parliament. So one of the things that they mentioned, so one of the first things they mentioned, is um, role of mosques. What is the role of mosques um, in, in um, promoting gender equality amongst men and women within the British Muslim communities? Now, this mosque is a wonderful example where you have men and women who come together, they actively make decisions together. You will hear women give speeches, you will hear women recite the Quran. That's very, very unusual. There are mosques in this country where women are not allowed to go and pray. Where if they will go and ask to pray, not on Friday, not on Juma, but they were asked to go and pray on another day, they will be turned away. Um, for some, there is a religious motivation, and I'm not going to go and get into that because I'm not qualified. But for others, it's just a tradition, it's just a culture. Um, and that's just to pray. So can you imagine women trying to ask if they can be involved in the decision making, in the governance and in those structures? And similarly to the way that... So earlier I spoke about how when you don't have meaningful representation of women in um, the House of Commons, then that impacts on the everyday lives of women in terms of the decisions they make around uh, around issues that affect women, but also just all issues. Um, in that way, when you don't have women involved in the mosque at every level, and especially at decision-making level, what you find is that then the needs of women are overlooked, the experience and understanding of women and children are also overlooked. And that's why you find that in many mosques and many community centers, facilities for women are an afterthought. Um, now, there is a sort of, um, if you like, you can call it a movement in the US where it's called side entrance. And this is to try and sort of highlight where um, mosques basically don't have appropriate uh, spaces and appropriate facilities of women, and they call it side entrance. And they sort of take a picture of, of the side entrance of the mosque where the women go in, and then the sort of the main entrance of the <laughs> men go in. And it's actually visually, when you see it, it's quite startling. Um, and, you know, you kind of. Like when I was growing up, I talk about this sort of from a more personal perspective. I never really noticed it because that, that's the way it is, right? You don't notice it when everybody, that's the way it is, right? But um, when I had children and then it was like, okay, I've got to take my child to the toilet, whatever. And then I noticed, oh, wow, this is appalling. This is appalling. There's no facilities. You know, there's, it's wet. It's cold. I mean, one mosque I had to, you know, the men could go toilet inside. But for the women, I'd have to take my child, my baby, go, you know, put my shoes on, come outside the mosque, around the side, get to the toilet. It's really, really cold. It's really busy. It's, it's Maharam. And, and then there isn't yet any sort of baby changing facilities either. And I can't change him inside the mosque because, no, that's wrong, basically, because, you know, you mustn't do that. That's whatever. So... You know, and, and it was only after having children that I realized that this is, this, is, this is not good. You know, the facilities for women are an afterthought. And I know here, this is not an issue for you guys, but it is an issue for many mosques around the country. Attitudes towards women and girls. Um, so another thing that the uh, report, that Women's Inequality report mentioned, uh, committee report mentioned, was that there are some attitudes towards women and girls which are prohibiting young women and girls um, from basically living a sort of full life. Um, so one example was um, a girl was offered, a young girl, university graduate, she was offered a job. I can't remember what the specifics of the job were, but it meant that she would have to work with a man um, and she and, and it would be visible, it would be seen to the sort of wider community and she turned the job down because she said she didn't want people to talk about her. She didn't want people to see her with a man and say, why is that young girl, Muslim girl, who wears a job with a man, a white man, why is she with him all day? What's she doing? Um, and it's these kind of you know, attitudes which are not Islamic, they're sort of culture, which are, again, they're inhibiting, they're prohibiting Muslim women when they are, when they are able to actually, you know, the, she, she got that job, despite all those barriers which I just mentioned, she got that job, but, but then she had to turn it down because she was so worried about the sort of, you know, backlash. And that's just one example. 
Um, there are other examples where, it, you know, young girls um, are told that they can't study or they shouldn't study because, you know, it, it's not their role and they're just supposed to get married or whatever. And, and we know that all of these things are not Islamic. They don't come from the religion, but there are sort of entrenched cultural attitudes. Um, I've also meant, I've mentioned already exclusion from decision making. Um, and uh, I've listed here not seen and not heard. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that when you go to a sort of Muslim function, whether that's in the mosque or a community center or whatever, and you don't see women participating, women are kind of on the side, um, you know, you know, they're not speakers, they're not reciting the Quran, then, you know, you basically don't hear of them. Then you basically have this idea from a very, very young age that that's the way it should be. Women should be not seen and not heard basically, and therefore they're automatically not on the same level as men. And um, this has very negative consequences when people interact or when men interact with women on an individual life and um, or individual basis. And uh, there is research, there's quite a lot of research actually, but not necessarily around Muslim women, which shows that when women are kind of seen in this sort of negative light, this kind of, you know, you shouldn't be seen, you shouldn't be heard kind of thing. That impacts on the way men view women and that contributes to domestic violence. And we know that Muslim women suffer domestic violence just as much, if not more, as, you know, other women in this society. And actually, I mentioned earlier the statistics of, um, the statistic of two women a week are being killed in the UK by a partner or somebody they know by a man. Um, if you look at their list, because the, the research group was sort of cataloguing these women who are killed every week, if you look at the list and you look at the names, um, actually I could see probably about, I don't know, four out of ten names were Muslim, maybe a bit more. And when you think about the fact that, so I'm, I'm sort of guessing that maybe it's about at least 25% in a year of those two women a week killed are Muslim women or of Muslim heritage. And then when you think about the fact that actually um, Muslim communities, what, 5% of the British population, that's an overrepresentation, And it shouldn't be that way, especially when you think about our faith and our religion and the wonderful examples we have of how women are treated. Um, it should not be that way, but unfortunately it is. Um, and I. I would love to kind of get into why, but that's like a whole sort of series of lectures by itself. And so I've mentioned judgmental attitudes. No, actually I haven't mentioned judgmental attitudes to, towards women. That's something I want to mention. So I think another issue that is universal to all the Muslim communities is the way we would judge women more harshly than we do men. Is she wearing hijab? No, she's not wearing hijab. She shouldn't come to the mosque. She can't do X, Y, and Z because she's not wearing hijab. Look what she's wearing. She's wearing skinny jeans. Women can't wear skinny jeans. All of this kind of stuff, basically. I just, suddenly I thought in my head, oh my God, am I wearing skinny jeans? Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. But um, <laughs> um, all of this stuff is, you know, it's perpetrated again. It's women and these, and, and, and it's constantly talked about. You know, I, I've forgotten the number of times I've gone to the mosque sort of really, you know, in Maharam, really wanting a kind of spiritual and uplifting lecture. And I've had to listen for 20 minutes about how a certain color of hijab or a certain under thing of a hijab is haram. Um, and, you know, people are allowed their opinions, but these have negative effects. These have negative effects on individual everyday lives of women. You know, women are having to deal with so much of that external stuff. It's so hard to get a job. It's so hard to achieve your education. You walk down the street and you're going to be attacked, right? That, that's, that's what Muslim women think, especially if they wear hijab, when they're, um, you know, walking down before they go out or they go on a tube. And then they go to the mosque and they're attacked again. Not because they're not wearing hijab, but because they're wearing a particular color, you know? And these, these are the barriers that we are creating in our own community against our own women. And I think, you know, I don't have the sort of automatic solution for this, well, apart from talk about something else. But we do need to reflect on this and reflect about how damaging these attitudes can be, not only for the women in our community, but for men in our community as well. 
Um, so let me move on to how can we address these um, internal challenges? What can we do? So I've listed here different things I think we can do. Um, so I think we can, um, and I know already in this community you do that very well, we can increase representation of women at all levels of mosques and community organizations. Businesses and other organizations are voluntarily taking on quotas. There have been suggestions that at the LSE uh, Gender Commission suggested that even the Houses of Parliament should have a quota for the number of women, and political parties should have a quota for the number of women that they recruit into their parties. Um, there isn't any legislation around this, but um, companies are now taking this on voluntarily. So actually maybe this is something that Muslim organizations and mosques and community organizations, charitable organizations could take on, could think about. I know it's not an issue here, but I know that, and I know that we're making you know, really good improvements in some other mosques, um, but actually that's really a minority. I could probably count the number of mosques on my two hands that have women you know, at, a, at a sort of decision-making level. Um, I haven't even spoken about the sort of sensitive issues that are faced by not just women but by our community, but in particular, you know, uh, issues around mental health. Um, I mentioned domestic violence, sexual violence, issues around abuse, issues around HIV. These are all things that, you know, all Muslims are dealing with, but again, particularly some of them are very, very gendered. So we need to create safe spaces in which we can talk about these issues and we can raise awareness on them, and we can try and tackle them. Um, and we also need to work on the attitudes as well, and try and remove the stigma around a lot of these issues, the stigma around divorce, the stigma around mental health, um, and to be more op op open. I think sometimes we're very open with you know, uh, people who aren't Muslim, welcome, welcoming them into our mosques and into our sort of communities, but actually we need to do that to the people who are not necessarily sort of, let me give an example. So somebody might not fast in Ramadan because they have a mental health issue, but if they came to the mosque, they probably wouldn't let anybody know that they're not fasting because of the stigma around it. So issues like that, we need to be more open in bringing forward those issues. Um, and then I've put it up there, it's not my expertise, but promote female scholarship. I think that's a very, very important issue because again, Without that understanding and the kind of the sort of real life understanding of what it means to be a woman and the challenges that they face, then and, and without having that involved in scholarship, then um, sometimes the needs in scholarship, the needs of women are not addressed, and they could easily be addressed by investing in female scholarship. Um, and I just sort of my last things, my sort of thing that I wanted to say to this community in particular was that you do so much great work and you're such a brilliant shining example of how gender equality could be achieved within the Muslim community that I'd really really sort of say to you and advocate to you that come out of your silo and work with other people around the country Muslims around the country and help them sort of come to where you are basically and I know that's not an easy thing I know it's a difficult thing but there's many different ways in which you can help them and I know that um, many of you are already doing that already but um, I think that'd be really important and that's my kind of one thing because you're doing everything so brilliantly so that's my one sort of thing that I could say to you today um, and uh, that's where I will leave it thank you very much <coughs> Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, if you look at the same issues in Muslim societies, Muslim mm -hmm. countries rather yeah. than societies, and here, do you think that the situation here is better than what would be at home? Um, well, yeah, that's a good question. What is home? For me, home is here, but I understand what you mean. Country of origin, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in my view, it is, but you know, I'm British, so I would say that, right? Um, but actually, statistically, if you look at it, then um, it's, it's, it's complex, but probably 
It is, and it, it does depend. You know, are you talking about Saudi Arabia then compared to Britain? Well, let's, let's look at uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh, yeah, because they <coughs> say 50% of the women will be coming from there. And so compare their status here, or, or in all these aspects, and back in Pakistan or Bangladesh. So um, if you look at those countries, and I don't have the stats to hand, but issues around, you know, obvious issues around education, employment, domestic violence, you know, they are much more worse for the women in those countries than they are, than they are for the women here. That's not to say all the women from Pakistan and Bangladesh are subjugated or are oppressed or don't have their own mind or are not, you know, um, assertive, creative women or whatever, or successful. There's many examples of those as well, but they are a minority compared to the majority. And what you will find actually is no, I won't say that, actually, because I was going to say something which I think would be too generalized. But I, I think definitely the experience of being a Muslim woman over here is probably better than being a Muslim woman sort of back home. But what's happening is that some of the kind of cultural issues that are being experienced in those countries are then brought to this country when communities move from um, those countries to here. And then those countries have now actually addressed some of those issues and are sort of moving forward and they're doing better. But the migrant communities are still dealing with those issues because they still have this idea of what things are like back home or, or they've kind of held really tightly to these cultural traditions, which they, you know, rightly or wrongly believe are Islamic or whatever. So, I mean, I, I agree that <coughs> this question of the, um, well, double, maybe triple penalty faced by women Mm -hmm. gender and then ethnicity and then religion, Muslim women, right? It's quite important to deal with, but it's uh, tackling that is challenged by the cultural baggage which we have, um, which means that <coughs> the whole of the Muslim community is not uh, in line to solve those. Yeah? Someone will say, what's wrong with that? Well, I think and so on. Yeah, this is the problem. So yeah, I think you know, first of all, the Muslim communities are not homogenous, and I should have made that clear from the beginning. And I think that just because things might be worse somewhere else doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and address the issues that are here. Because if they're left undressed, then they're only going to get worse. And the the, the sort of triple penalty that I described does not just come from you know, internal issues within the Muslim community. It comes from structural issues outside. And, the, and this is, and, and basically this is where inter, intersectionality comes in because you have the inter, internal challenges and external challenges. And I spoke about them in sort of two discrete things, but actually they're, in, they're interacting all the time. Um, and so this is why I sort of gave those examples of, you know, a young girl who got a job despite all those barriers, but then her own culture sort of held her back from then taking that job on. Other women, wasn't it? Or was it the men stopping them? To be honest with you, I don't know. But it, I think it's more of, it's not about who, it's well, more I suggest of a, it's it more is of the actual attitude. Women who was doing that, exactly coming back to what it was said earlier on, yeah? I agree with you. The same thing, right? Just look, look, this girl is uh, working with this man, so, you know, she's going to get married, right? That kind of attitude she'll have. <laughs> You're right in that women do perpetuate these same sort of stereotypes as well, the same sort of inequality. It's not just men who perpetuate it. That's a valid point. And that's why education around gender inequality is very, very important um, for men and women. Sorry, go on. Um, I think um, for me, one of the big things I think within kind of a lot of Muslim communities is the kind of, is, is domestic responsibilities. So household responsibilities in terms of, um, you know, washing and cleaning and, and childcare responsibilities. And I think, that then has a big implication in terms of, you know, access to employment, ability to study, um, engendering um, particular um, uh, kind of particular attitudes into the next generation. Um, and I think this is something that I feel that has been quite stagnant 
across generations. And I don't, and I don't know if a lot of people think it's an issue. Um, I think there is a lot of internalization across or down the generation. Um, but I, this is something that I think in order to address a lot of the other issues, you need to fundamentally address this, this particular, I don't know if you want to call it an issue because some people might not even think it's an issue, um, but this particular area. And I think if you tackle that, a lot, of, a lot of other things will fall into place because women will have a lot more time. They'll have the ability to express themselves in particular ways. They'll have the ability to then go and study or to take employment or whatever else it is. Um, or even choose not to, or choose to, you know, to, to do something completely different. But actually having that time and the ability to do that is important. How do you think that we go about in addressing that? Because I think if I look at our community or this particular community, I think they've been very good in terms of so they came from, you know, they came from India, Pakistan, um, all of these countries where they weren't given the opportunity to necessarily study, and so they've engendered in both their, you know, both the, the, the their their male and female children, this 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 kind of focus on education. So men and women in 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 the Indian community, for example, both study equally, but when they get to a certain age and they decide to, you know, you know, get married or start a family, then that ability to kind of use that education or use those particular skills then diminishes because they have significantly more domestic responsibilities. And I think I'm, I'm, I just haven't seen that much of a shift. So I've just seen this idea of women working double days rather than actually a more equal sharing of responsibilities. And the cultural attitude I just don't think has moved at all almost. So women have now started to work, but they're actually just, just more tired and more stressed. Um, and, I think, uh, and it's true across, you know, across the whole of the UK population. But I think it's particularly bad. Like you look at statistics in terms of sharing of household responsibilities, and and Asian communities, Muslim communities tend to fare a lot worse, or Muslim women in those communities fare a lot worse. <coughs> so what's the kind of solution in terms of tackling those types of attitudes, which I think then will feed into other other yeah. inequalities. Um, so I think you're absolutely right in that this this is an issue which affects all women in the UK, not just Muslim women. A majority of sort of caring responsibilities and domestic duties fall to women, um, and that's and the LSE Gender Commission actually talks about that um, as part of its sort of work-life balance measure, um, and that's probably uh, the same in many countries in Europe as well. Um, what can you do about it? I think for Muslims, we actually are in a kind of unique position in that we have resources available to us which could change those attitudes. And those resources are the Quran and the Hadith, basically, because I think, you know, the Quran talks about how, um, and again, I'm not an expert, so I don't know the verse, but how, you know, um, a husband should make provision for a woman if, if she wants to, to have a wet nurse. And um, and to be and, and if a woman's bringing up children and she, or she's breastfeeding or whatever, then she could be remunerated. Um, and then we have hadith as well, where you know Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he came to Imam Ali and he came to be Fatima alayhi salam. And sometime and I, I don't quote me because I don't know if I'm remembering the hadith correctly or not. But I think uh, B. Fatima alayhi salam was doing something with flour, um, and then uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam told Imam Ali to take over from her. So we've got lots of hadith like that where actually they're, they're sort of specific around domestic duties, but there isn't that kind of focus. Um, and and, and when, 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 when the hadith are relayed, we kind of don't take that sort of extra meaning from it that actually, you know, Prophet Muhammad was signaling that a man or the husband, even somebody like Imam Ali, can do a domestic duty. And I think we've kind of got this opportunity where we can use that to shift cultural issues well, specifically Muslim communities I'm talking about. Obviously, you know, if you're talking to non-Muslims, it's not going to have the same sort of meaning. Um, and I think, you know, there's so many layers, you know, it's about, you know, who does the kind of domestic duties in the community centres. If you're only going to see women doing domestic duties and they're not taking part in kind of governance and the decision making, then there is going to be this idea that that's the role of women. You know, the role is to kind of do that sort of cleaning, cooking or whatever. Um, but I think with the younger generations, it is changing. Um, I could be wrong, but I think it is changing. But I think probably when there's a sort of more wider cultural shift, not just within the Muslim communities, then we will see more of a cultural shift within Muslim communities as well. But 
I think, you know, Muslims could lead the way in that, in creating that kind of shift if they kind of use the resources we have available to us and actually kind of really thought about some of the verses in the Quran and the Hadith and things. I don't know, what do you think? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the statistics are very clear in terms of kind of sharing of responsibilities, and, and Muslim women tend to fare, or Muslims and mis, Muslim women just tend to fare a lot worse um, in, in that regard. In terms of you know how much time do they spend on house, you know, hmm. household responsibilities, cooking, cleaning, childcare, and that's not to say necessarily it's a completely a bad thing, but the fact that they don't in a lot in in a, in a large proportion of cases don't have the choice otherwise. Um, and even if you look at, for example, levels of economic in inactivity um, and reasons as to why Muslim women are economically inactive, it's not always out of choice as well. And if you give them the choice of going back to employment, a lot of them would. And they cite reasons like cultural expectations, household responsibilities, and not being able to manage. Um, so the census, I think the 2011 census had some data on Muslim women in particular. Um, and they did like a sample of, I think, 500 women, Muslim women, like a subsample of. 500 women, and they found that a lot of them actually did want to go back. The ones that were economically inactive did want to go back and couldn't because they felt like they didn't have the time and support from their communities and their families to do so. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the the the, the non-Muslim community has moved a lot further than we have in this regard. Um, yeah, no, I agree. I think the stats show that as well. The data shows that. Yeah. Take one more question if there is one. This might be <coughs> sorry, this might be slightly off topic and to completely play devil's advocate, not saying this is what I think, but maybe something perhaps a little more controversial. I recently read like a post or an article from a female Muslim speaker um, who was answering a question. Have you read it? I think it's it's gone quite viral, yeah. Um, about how she was answering a question about a woman who led prayer, and the the post was about asking about, you know, have women actually progressed? Does this mean that we've progressed? And she was basically saying how um, women in general seem to now have this idea that the standard should be men. So everything a man does, a woman should want to do because that means all oh, will be equal. But from a religious perspective, she was talking about how does that show us in the eyes of God? Um, and God has created us differently, and there are obviously things that women might be better at or more suited to. So, for example, what she quoted was, however much a man tries or wants to, he'll never be able to bear children. Like, that's something that's just given to women. Um, so it seems like how, especially like Western culture and how society's kind of progressed, we seem to think that, men are the standard so to to be equal or to see ourselves as like good enough we have to be doing the same things that men do so like i said just playing devil's advocate what's your take on that um i think that basically equality doesn't mean being like men or sort of replicating what men do um for me that's not what equality is about it's about um removing those structural barriers that women face. It's about allowing them to have the same sort of privilege that men in